Well, good morning. Welcome to the Mazars Federal Budget Webinar. I'm Michael Jones coming to you from Melbourne and I'll be your host today. We have a great team assembled to take you through the key tax and superannuation aspects of the budget. So look, why don't we, let's meet our team of presenters this morning. In, um, we've got Evan Beisel, the tax partner in Melbourne. Hi Evan, how are you going? Hi Michael, good to be here. Great, we've got Clive Todd. Clive's the head of superannuation in Brisbane. Good morning, Clive. How's the weather in Brisbane? Hi, Michael. The weather's great and welcome to everybody from the Brisbane, the home of good weather, strong borders and the AFL. All right, enough from you. Now, we've got Stephen Baxter, the National Head of Indirect Tax. Good morning to you, Stephen, in Sydney. How are you? I'm, I'm well, Michael. I'm glad to be here. Thanks right. very much. And we have Jamie Towers, who's the Head of the Tax Consulting Practice in Brisbane. Good morning, Jamie. Hello. How are you? Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, good morning, Michael. Um, great to be here. Thanks. Yep, thank you. Jamie will lead our question and answer panel discussion in the last half hour of, of this webinar. But in the first hour, we'll cover tax, superannuation and indirect taxes and state-based programs. And the final half hour will be the, the, the question and answer where you get a chance to ask the expert panel your questions in relation to the budget. Now on that topic, to ask a question, if you look on the screen below me, next to the timeline, you'll notice a speech bubble. Now that's the ask button. So if you'd like to pose a question or comment at any time during this webcast, you just click on the speech bubble. You fill out a form and then you click send. Now we'll answer those questions in the last half hour, but don't wait till then. I fully recommend that you submit your questions now and, and keep on going throughout the webinar. And I also encourage you to provide your name and an email address along with your question or comment. And that way, if we don't get a chance to answer your question in that last half hour, we can follow up with you afterwards and we will. Okay, but now to our topic this morning, the pandemic budget. You know, the business has responded to the pandemic with the business shutdowns and the drastic economic uncertainty with turbocharged incentives to encourage business to hire workers and buy new equipment. That is basically the heart of this budget. The government obviously wants to give business confidence so that people and businesses will spend. And make no mistakes, these tax incentives are extraordinary. I've never seen such significant tax incentives before. The important thing for you is to understand how these significant incentives work for you in your particular circumstances. So let's move on. Our first presenter, as I said, is the Melbourne tax partner and leading tax specialist, Evan Bysall. Evan will help you apply the budget incentives so that you can understand your particular circumstances. So Evan, over to you, please. Well, thank you, Michael. Well, indeed, 2020 has been no ordinary year and the 2020 budget is no ordinary budget. Our economy is hurting from the effects of COVID-19 and this justifies significant fiscal measures to get the economy back on its feet. Now, this is a budget for business, a budget to keep businesses in business and drive business investment. And this is reflected in the tax and incentive measures contained in this year's budget. I'm going to be talking through the key tax and incentive measures in this year's budget. Now these measures are particularly targeted at businesses that are willing to spend with the right incentives. However, this will not be all businesses and some businesses that are still really hurting may feel they've been left behind. So I'm going to start by talking through some of the key tax measures for businesses. And so to start with, one of the most significant measures this year is a significant measure allowing upfront deductions for new assets uh, with no uh, limit on the cost of those assets. We have 
a company loss carryback measure that will allow companies to claim back tax they've paid on prior years. Changes to the R&D tax incentives intended to encourage investment in research and development. And whilst not strictly a tax incentive, a, a key incentive measure is the job maker hiring credits that are encouraging businesses to create new jobs for people who are unemployed. So starting with the upfront deduction for new assets. This new measure provides an upfront tax deduction for purchasing new business assets, such as machinery, uh, equipment, vehicles. So this is depreciating assets, not land and buildings, for example. But importantly, there's no limit on costs. Businesses with up to $5 billion of turnover are eligible. In practice, this will mean the measure will apply to most businesses that operate in Australia. And look, our experience is the business like these measures. They, they, give, they do help with cash flow and they do encourage businesses to buy assets. Now, this is a temporary measure. It's only going to apply to assets acquired from budget night through to 30 June 2022. And it is intended to stimulate business investment, therefore, in the short to medium term. However, a few things to note on this. I mean, firstly, it is only a timing benefit. These are assets that businesses would otherwise be able to claim depreciation deductions over time. And so instead, it's just front loading that benefit. And if um, those assets are sold in the future and, and the business receives money, those, those sale proceeds will be accessible income. So it's really just um, front loading a tax deduction that would have otherwise been received over time. And secondly, businesses still need to be willing to put uh, their hands in their pockets to buy these assets. This will require confidence, not just tax breaks. And uh, look, thirdly, many businesses prefer to align their tax, um, their tax depreciation to their accounting depreciation for simplicity. And this may no longer be possible for a number of businesses. So if you're uh, if you're required to apply accounting standards, then, the, then you won't be able to write off your accounting balances of these assets. Or if you're trying to show a strong balance sheet for um, getting finance or banking covenants, um, then this is going to mean a significant misalignment in the tax and accounting treatment where you're getting the full tax deduction up front but still depreciating for accounting over time. That's going to add complexity for businesses in their accounting and tax affairs. Now, in recent years, these upfront deductions have been a key feature of government tax policy. However, the new measure is the most generous and applies to the largest number of businesses. Now, the table I've got here is a, a short history of asset write-off thresholds. Certainly, there's, there's longer history to this, but I thought um, this was enough to get the picture. Um, and you can see in this table the thresholds that have applied over the last few years, um, starting there with a $20,000 threshold um, for businesses with under $10 million of aggregated turnover. And then what we see is that both the cost threshold and the turnover threshold has gradually increased over time until we get to the measures um, proposed in this week's budget for almost all businesses to receive upfront deductions for most asset purchases until 30 June 22. And I'll just note briefly, there is a carve out under this new, uh, these new rules for secondhand assets for businesses with 50 million of turnover or more. And whilst I haven't shown it in the asset and in this table until 30 June 2021, businesses in this third column, the 50 million to 500 million businesses, will be able to claim an upfront deduction for second-hand assets up to the $150,000 threshold that's currently in place. Now, one thing to note about these thresholds is they've all been temporary, framed as an incentive to invest in the short term. However, time and time again, these measures have been extended and expanded. 
So it will be interesting to see what happens after 30 June 22. Will we fall off an instant asset right off cliff or will this measure or a scaled back version be extended beyond then? My money would be on this measure continuing in some form, but more likely with a cost threshold and limited to maybe small and medium businesses. So moving on then to the company loss carryback provisions. So this is another significant measure for businesses in this year's budget. But what does a company loss carryback mean? Well, under the existing rules, a co company tax losses can only be carried forward and to future years. And therefore, they're only valuable if and when in those future years there, would, uh, there is a taxable profit that those losses can be offset against. A loss carryback measure allows a company that makes a loss in one year to be able to apply the loss against a prior year's taxable profits and then receive a refund of, of some of the tax paid in that prior year. Now we've seen company tax, company loss carryback measures before. Now these were actually briefly implemented back in, in 2013, intended as a permanent measure, but were then repealed after applying for just one year. This time around, this is a temporary measure and only applies for tax losses that arise in the 2020, 2021 and 2022 tax years. Losses in these years can be carried back to the 2019 tax year or later tax years. And so will be particularly relevant for businesses that either are you know, needing to shoulder losses as they get back on their feet, but also, and this is critical, um, businesses that take advantage of that upfront deduction measure and by doing so generate substantial deductions from capital purchases may in doing so generate tax losses in, in the next couple of years. They may be able to take advantage of this measure to instead of simply carrying forward those tax losses, get a cash refund for some of the value of those losses. And look, overall, I think this is a good measure that will help companies that qualify to improve their cash flow. But it certainly has some limitations. Firstly, let's talk about the timing. The refund will be paid with lodgement of the 2021 or 2022 tax returns. So even, so there'll be a delay to this benefit to come through, even for 2020 year tax losses. But most significantly, I think a, a real shortcoming of this is that businesses that operate through other types of structures, such as sole traders, trusts, partnerships, they're not going to get the benefit of this measure. And this, I think, shows a government out of touch with the business structures that are used by thousands of Australian businesses. And it's hard to see a meaningful policy reason to limit this measure to businesses that use a company structure. So, you know, if your business is in a trust, for example, unfortunately, you know, this measure is not going to help you. And I think that's a real shortcoming of this measure. So I've put together a short example here showing how the loss carryback measure works. In this example, the company had $1 million of taxable income in 2019, and then it's made a tax loss in 2020. And I've got two scenarios here, one where the loss is less than the 2019 taxable income and another where it's a greater amount. And you'll see that in the first column where the loss is less than the prior year um, taxable income, the full value of the, loss of, of the loss is available as a carryback refund. So that's the $150,000 there that would be available as a refund. Whilst in the second column, the full value of the, the or the tax affected value of the loss would be 450,000, but the refund is limited to the tax that was actually paid in 2019 being the $300,000. Now, in practice, the refund from a 2020 loss is not actually gonna be received until the 2021 tax return is lodged. And at that time, you know, there might be a tax liability for 2021 that it's gonna offset the refund or if there's a further 
um, carryback available for 2021, both of those carryback refunds are going to be received at that time. So on the whole, loss carryback, look, I think it's, it's a good way for businesses to access some extra cash flow. I think it's a shame that it is going to take so long before that cash hits the bank for those businesses. And, you know, that may really limit the benefit of this measure. And look, I think it's, it's really disappointing that it is confined to companies giving so many of our businesses in Australia do operate out of other structures. So the next measure I want to talk about is changes um, to the R&D tax incentive. And the R&D tax incentive rules provide an ongoing incentive scheme for companies to undertake research and development activities in Australia. And the scheme operates by providing a tax credit for eligible R&D tax expenditure. It is a two-tier system. Businesses with tw less than 20 million of turnover can get, currently get a 43.5% refundable tax offset. So they can receive a cash refund if they're not paying any tax. Larger businesses get a non-refundable offset at a lower rate. So they can only apply the offset against their tax liabilities that are arising in the current and future years. Now, an important mechanism of, of the R&D tax incentive is the expenditure. Once, once you apply the R&D tax incentive, eligible expenditure is no longer tax deductible, but instead only um, gets the tax offset under the R&D tax incentive. So the real benefit is actually the difference between the company tax rate and the R&D tax incentive rate. Now, a number of changes had been previously announced, but not yet legislated. And they involved pegging the, um, the R&D tax incentive rate to the company tax rate, acknowledging that company tax rates are now different for some companies, and that the true value of the R&D tax incentive lies in this differential and also a cap on the cash refund for businesses with less than 20 million of turnover and um, introducing an intensity of each test, essentially a tiered system for, um, for companies with more than 20 million turnover and giving them different rates of R&D tax incentive based on that intensity of test. So the proposed changes in the budget uh, this week tweak these proposed changes in a way that provides a greater benefit to business. So let me talk through those. They're up on the slide here. So firstly, um, we will for the businesses with turnover below $20 million, we'll have a refundable tax offset based, again, pegged in the company tax rate, but with an 18.5% premium. That's an increase from the proposed 13.5% premium. So essentially what that does for businesses for many businesses in this category who will have a 25% company tax rate, it will retain a 43.5% R&D tax incentive rate uh, for their R&D expenditure. Uh, removes the $4 million cash refund cap. And for those larger companies, it does retain this intensity test, but increases the rates that will apply to give a greater benefit of the R&D tax incentive. Otherwise, the, the, the other structural changes that are proposed will proceed. However, what these changes don't do is they don't address some significant structural issues that exist in the R&D tax incentive rules. For example, the R&D tax incentive as it currently exists has a pretty narrow scope. It, you really need to fit into a narrow category of, of R&D and demonstrate that it's rigorous and scientific in a way that doesn't contemplate the full range of innovation that companies are engaging in Australia and doesn't incentivise innovation more broadly. Also, you know, the way the rules are drafted now are co complex and costly for businesses to apply and these changes don't do anything to address that. So whilst I think these changes are certainly welcome, there is a room for a lot more reform in this space. And I would have liked to see uh, some stronger measures to really encourage innovation across the board. So next, I'll just talk about the job maker hiring credit. So again, this is 
a significant incentive in the budget. And this is a credit provided for businesses who create new jobs for people under 35 who are currently receiving unemployment benefits. So it's a 12 month benefit running from the 7th of October and employers will either receive a $200 credit per week for um, each eligible employee between 16 and 29 years of age or a $100 per week credit for employees aged between 30 and 35. Now the eligibility for that is that employers must demonstrate that these new employees are increasing their headcount and payroll and employers will need to work a minimum of 20 hours a week and have received either job seeker, youth allowance or parenting payment for at least one month in the last three prior to hiring. So I think there's a good incentive for business that can uh, for businesses that are positioned to make use of it, those that see opportunities to expand and take on new employees. But it certainly has some limitations. Um, you can see that qualifying workers will likely be favoured over other workers. So for example, older workers, people on visas that are not eligible for job keepers, such as international students, these people will, may find it even harder to get a job because those businesses that are hiring will be looking to hire um, employees that can qualify under this scheme. Um, also, you know, demonstrating that increase in headcount and payroll, uh, you know, I think there would be some practical challenges in demonstrating that. For example, what if you are trying to genuinely add a new position in your business, but at the same time an existing employee resigns and you haven't yet been able to fill their position? Even if the jobs are different, will you be able to demonstrate that you're trying to increase your overall headcount and payroll? So look, I think a good measure in terms of trying to get people into jobs, but it does have some shortcomings and it will be interesting to see how those play out. So a few other tax measures for businesses that I'll just go over quickly. Firstly, a an FBT exemption for training and reskilling workers. So this removes FBT to encourage work employers to retrain and redeploy employers that might otherwise be let go. So under the current rules, if you provide training that's not sufficiently connected to an employee's current role, that's subject to FBT. And this exemption removes that burden to encourage you to retrain and redeploy. The small, some small business tax concessions, so a number of specific small business tax concessions that currently have a $10 million turnover threshold will have that threshold increase to $50 million. And just briefly, some of these um, of note, some immediate deductions for startup expenses, uh, FBT exemptions for car parking and multiple electronic devices, uh, the simplified trading stock rules, and a two-year amendment period for tax returns instead of the standard four-year amendment period. I think these are all welcome, but uh, mostly they're not, they're not particularly significant. And thirdly, corporate tax residency. So this is a change to the rules that determine when a foreign incorporated company can be an, an Australian resident for tax purposes. Currently, these rules can deem an Australian controlled foreign company to be a tax resident even if it has no operations in Australia. The proposed changes would mean a foreign company would only be a tax resident where it has com core commercial activities in Australia and its central management and control is in Australia. And this requirement to have core commercial activities in Australia is a sensible condition that will provide more certainty for foreign companies that have connections to Australia. Also not on the slide, but worth a brief mention is a provision to provide an income tax exemption for Victorian government business support grants provided after the 13th of September. This is a sensible exemption that ensures businesses get the full benefit of those grants. So what about individuals? Well, the key measure that affects individuals is bringing forward the stage two of the government's personal income tax plan by two years 
to commence from 1 July 2020. So you can see in the table and the red numbers highlight the changes here compared to the tax rates that would have applied and those tax rates that would have applied would be are the same as those at the left of the table for the 1920 year. And so what we have is an increase and the top of the 19% rate in band to 45,000 and an increase in the top of the 32.5% rate band to 120,000. This will translate to a tax saving of up to $2,430 for taxpayers earning $120,000 or more in the current tax year. And this is intended to get money into people's pocket, but the withholding tables, so the, the, the tax office tables that say how much an employer needs to withhold, will only be updated prospectively. So only some of this benefit is going to flow to employees once those tables get updated. Taxpayers will have to wait until lodging their tax return after the end of the year to get the benefit of these rates for the first few months of the year. Now I just note briefly that there's no change to stage three of the tax cuts. That's the, the third column of this table. These will still come in from 1 July 2024. Now, briefly, a few further measures for individuals. Firstly, the, the low income tax offset. This has, has been increased in line with the planned increase with the stage two tax cuts to a maximum of a $700 offset. The low and middle income tax offset that was intended to be removed as the stage two tax cuts come in, but it's been retained for the 2021 tax year to make sure that bringing forward the stage two tax cuts provides the maximum immediate benefit in the current year. And thirdly, we've got a CGT exemption for granny flats. Um, currently, if you have a formal arrangement uh, for a relative to um, occupy a granny fat flat on your property that can cause a capital gain that's taxable and this exemption is removing that capital gain to, which will encourage people to enter into those formal arrangements and help care for our elderly. So just to wrap up then, look the tax measures in this year's budget are all about encouraging businesses to spend and to stimulate economic growth. The significant measures are all temporary we're not seeing any structural tax reform. Businesses who are struggling to get by may not be in a position to take advantage of many of these measures. And look, finally, look, these measures are focused on getting money into the economy through businesses, with the personal tax cuts representing a relatively modest effort to get cash directly into the hands of consumers but we're not seeing significant measures to get tax, to get money directly into the hands of consumers. So I'll wrap it up there. Thank you again and back to you, Michael. Thank you, Evan, well done. I think you needed a glass of water at the end there. Have a drink now. You know, Evan makes an important point on how the incentives <clears throat> work together so that for profitable businesses that, you know, they're now, they were profitable, but now they're facing uncertain times, that ability to carry back losses to those profitable years, that provides these businesses with some certainty on, you know, actually getting the cash benefit from the deductions. But as Evan also said, you know, pay attention to the timing of those cash benefits. I'd also like to just underline that one of the changes to fringe benefits tax is the elimination of fringe benefits tax on car parking. I think it's great and it's a welcome change for medium businesses. Now we've got a lot of questions, a reminder to keep them coming in. If we don't get to them, we'll still answer you over the next few days. All right, time to move on. Now our next presenter is Clive Todd. As I said before, Clive's there 
superannuation partner based in Brisbane. But, you know, Clive, he's got a wealth of experience from working closely with clients on superannuation strategies for many, many years. So, Clive, a relatively peaceful budget for self-managed super funds, I'd say. Yeah, thanks, Michael. It's a bit of a tough gig talking about superannuation following the uh, budget the other night. Um, as Evan sort of alluded to, it was mainly about jobs and the economy, but the government still managed to make sure superannuation got a mention at least. So I'll do my best with what I've got. Um, going into talking about budget announcements and also mention a couple of other little measures that are still around, uh, weren't mentioned in the budget, but is important to talk about. Now, I guess the most important part, sometimes no news is good news. Um, having no major changes in superannuation for the second year in a row is probably a good thing. Um, we were sick many years ago of things changing repeatedly and confidence was getting lost. So um, no changes again is probably actually a good thing. I, I won't complain about having nothing to talk about. There was one package announced, however, um, with the snazzy tagline of your future, your super. Um, so what is that? There's four measures to it. Um, stapling of superannuation accounts, and that's not as painful as it sounds. Uh, the your super portal, increased accountability and increased benchmarking tests. Now these will apply from 1st of July, 2021, if the government gets it through. Firstly, stapled superannuation accounts. That is going to be where superannuation accounts follow an employee from job to job. Currently, when you change a job, you tend to, if you don't nominate a, your fund, the employer just starts paying contributions into their default fund and you end up with another superannuation account. Um, by stapling the account to you means that the employer will be compelled to pay it into your existing superannuation which will hopefully avoid the multiple super accounts that people have at the moment and ultimately save fees um, for people's retirement benefits. That's the intention of the government here. Now, there has been some concern around this where people will say, if you've got your account stapled to you, and you might find you're stuck with a bad fund. But that probably leads into some of the other measures that the government's trying to do here uh, so that you can get more choice, more transparency, about whether your fund is a bad one or not. So the second part, your super portal. So this will be another online comparison tool, um, which you'll be able to have the opportunity to go onto and compare my super products. They'll all be in there and they'll be ranked by fees and investment performance. So it should be fairly straightforward to be able to see how your fund is going compared to others. You'll also be able to see where you've got multiple super accounts and have the opportunity to consolidate them. So the government's intent here is that it's going to be a fairly interactive tool, as opposed to probably some of the other comparison sites that are around at the moment. Like I think you are able to go online and find out plenty of information about performance and fees, but this is just hopefully going to streamline all that and make it a lot easier for people to do so. Increased benchmarking tests. So, a bit like the Brisbane Broncos, there's a lot of large super funds out there that are being paid a lot to perform badly. And I think the government's a bit sick of it. So they are bringing in an annual test on investment performance for my super products. So this will give the uh, super funds the opportunity to then, well, they'll be compelled to then report to their members if they are underperforming. So that's gonna be a nice, interesting letter or email you get in the mail to say, you are part of an underperforming fund. Um, I'm not sure how the big funds will be enjoying that. And further to that, if they are underperforming for two consecutive years, there's gonna be further restrictions on them where they will not be allowed to uh, admit new members to that fund until they get back into a positive or a good performing year. Um, Again, there's going to be a bit of detail about this forthcoming. Uh, we don't know what underperformance actually is. Um, the government's interpretation of underperformance might not be the same as the super funds and might not be the same as the individual. So it will be interesting to see where that lands, um, but it's probably got a few people shaking in their shoes at the moment. Transparency is what it's all about, and I think that's not a bad thing. Like People are wanting to and needing to take more of an interest in their superannuation, 
um, and by getting more information via portals, via benchmarking, um, hopefully will lead that to helping them make good decisions about their retirement benefits. Now, the final part of the Your Future, Your Super um, measures is increased accountability. Now, this is a bit of a, a strange one because the government's wanting to, um, I guess, put into legislation that super fund trustees need to uh, comply with a duty to act in the best interests of their members. One would have assumed that they already did that, but uh, potentially maybe the uh, number of sporting sponsorships, et cetera, um, that you see regarding superannuation funds uh, belays that thinking. Um, they will also need to demonstrate that any actions, any decisions they make are in the best interests of their members. Um, so again, more accountability, more transparency, and, and I guess more uh, comfort for members that the, their super funds are doing the right thing by them. Now, as Michael sort of said, this you know, super fund, self-managed super funds have been a bit immune from all this, and this measure isn't expected to apply to uh, self-managed super fund trustees because, well, they are the members. So there's probably not, um, the, the assumption is there that they are already acting in the best interests of themselves. Um, that, unfortunately, pretty much sums up the budget announcements. As I promised, there wasn't a lot there, but the, you know, there's been a bit of discussion around the self-funded retirees being left out, being, um, I guess, probably ignored as part of this budget. But my thinking behind that is with the focus on the economy, on in increasing jobs, um, building up the, the, the economy again, that should hopefully flow through into share performance, into returning of dividends, um, which should then mean that self-funded retirees are better off in the long run. Um, just there's no direct announcements. The final bits and pieces, a few other measures that are around that are worthwhile just uh, mentioning. Firstly, the super guarantee. Now, the government is still pushing forward with their intention to raise the super guarantee rate from 9.5% to 10%, um, effective from the 1st of July 2021. Now, there's still a bit of time before that, and I'm sure this will come up for some more debate. And I think we also need to remember that there's another budget um, <laughs> before the end of the financial year, which is quite strange. But that I'm sure we'll hear more about, but the intention is still there to be pushing forward with it. A couple of measures then just on the COVID-19. Um, I'm not sure if everybody recalls, but there was a reduction, um, a halving of the minimum pension requirements for both the 2020 financial year and the 2021 financial year. So in other words, you had a pension in place, you didn't need to take out as much to meet your minimum pension requirements. Now the government stated their uh, intention that that will not be extended past this financial year. So come the 2022 financial year, your minimum pensions will be back to whatever they should be based on your account balance at the 30th of June. Um, again, there may be further changes come uh, announced in the next budget, but that's what it is at the moment. And finally, just to keep in mind, um, this has already been extended from the 24th of September, uh, but you've got the ability to withdraw via the uh, early access if you're impacted by COVID-19, up to $10,000 from your superannuation fund prior to the 31st of December this year. So you were able to do it once before the 30th of June, 2020. You are able to also do another up to $10,000, but it's got to be done prior to the 31st of December. And the government stated that there will be no extension to that cutoff date. Um, so keep that in mind. So again, uh, in summary, not a lot going on. Um, Self-funded retirees, while you might have been left out, hopefully the economy will come better for you. I worry that in the future, um, the $3 trillion that is sitting in superannuation may be a bit of a uh, pot for the government to come after to help pay back some of this debt. But watch this space. Currently, the government's stuck with their election promise that there would be no adverse taxes or changes to superannuation. So fingers crossed that continues. Back to you, Michael. Okay, thank you, Clive. You know, I welcome this focus on superannuation fees rather than, you know, 
changing further the self-managed super fund rules. And I think it indicates like a maturing of the sector. And um, although it, it's a focus for the, for the public superannuation funds, I also expect that um, one of the, con there's this proposal currently in parliament, which I expect will be passed, enabling self-managed super funds to increase their members to six people. Now that's not something that will work for everybody, but if it is suitable for you and you do get more members in your super fund, that will also bring down the cost per member of, of, of fees for running that self-managed super fund. So again, something else worthwhile to have a conversation with your advisor about whether that works for you or not. I also think, uh, you know, there's always things to do in self-managed super fund and now is a perfect time to focus on what I think is the most important area, and that is understanding how your self-managed super fund fits in with your estate plan and understanding how control of your self-managed super fund works in relation to your estate plan. There's always things to do in uh, self-managed super fund area for sure. And also send me in some questions about superannuation on anything. I wanna make sure that Clive, you know, Gets, doesn't get to clock off early and has, has something to do. Um, all right, so our last presenter before we open up for questions is our National Head of Indirect Tax, Stephen Baxter. So Stephen will discuss GST and other indirect tax matters and also give a summary of the state responses to the um, COVID-19 crisis that are current and still relevant for our businesses. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you, Michael. Uh, for my uh, Mazars budget webinar debut, I was, I was hoping to be able to uh, take you through the ins and outs of uh, some major changes to the rate and base of GST, but that's uh, not to be and not surprising uh, given that the community just wouldn't tolerate increases in the cost of living at a time when so many are dependent on government support. But there have been three changes in the indirect tax space announced with this budget, and uh, they are limited to certain industries and sectors, and I'll go through them now. The... Uh, the first one is simplified accounting methods for GST. Now, the current position is that the commissioner can issue a simplified accounting method determination, which is a legislative instrument, which simplifies the GST calculation and reporting for retailers, for charities, and for small business entities that make both taxable and GST free supplies and to certain small enterprise entities that do not carry on a business. In practice, the current SAM determinations issued, the simplified accounting method determinations issued by the commissioner have only applied to retailers whose turnover is no more than $2 million and where that uh, retailer has inadequate point of sale equipment to report into GST categories. So in other words, at the cash register, if you like, they're not able to, uh, to um, allocate the sales they make between taxable and GST free categories. So, so not only is the current uh, scope of issuing a simplified accounting method determination limited, but the commissioner has only issued them in a couple of very minor fields. I once asked a, uh, a senior ATO officer, well, you know, how many businesses use simplified accounting methods? And he said, well, we don't know because they don't tell us. And, um, and we, we chatted a bit and he said, look, I suspect it's under 5,000 businesses across the country. So they're, they're not a widely used mechanism. Just to, just to give you some very quick background, the two types of current simplified accounting methods are, are one, 
where you're able to report GST in your BAS based on part period samples. So in other words, you might undertake a four week sample of supplies and acquisitions, you calculate the uh, percentages of GST free sales and acquisitions during that sample period based on actuals, and then you apply those percentages to quarterly totals of gross sales and stock purchases. So in other words, if, if the uh, GST free percentage comes out at 50%, you just apply GST to 50% of the, uh, the cash register takings. Um, the, other, the other category is called business norms, and they are standard percentages determined by the commissioner for a retailer type. And I've given two examples in the table there, fresh fish shops and hot bread shops. And to, to explain those, uh, the, the fresh fish shop, if they use this business norm method, uh, they are able to uh, account for GST with, on, on the sales with only 35% uh, treated as GST free and 65% subject to GST. On the acquisition side, they are required to treat 98% of their acquisitions as GST free and can only claim credits for 2% of those. So you can just see from that example, they're not exactly generous. What the position will be from the 1st of July 2021 is that the Commissioner will now be able to issue a simplified accounting method determination for businesses with turnover from 10 million to 50 million. So there's a huge number of further businesses that could adopt simplified accounting methods, but it awaits the Commissioner to actually issue them. And so the questions we have are, will the Commissioner expand those determinations beyond retailers? And, and will they widely include those who have adequate point of sale equipment? We don't know. Um, there are flu few clues as to what uh, likely new simplified accounting methods. Uh, we, we don't know of any industry sectors that have pushed hard for this new measure. Um, simplified GST accounting is a very worthy objective, uh, don't get me wrong, and uh, everyone is, is looking to decrease the time and the cost of tax compliance, but it, it is quite hard to detect substantial beneficiaries of this measure. And uh, given, for example, they, they don't even cover uh, businesses that make input tax supplies as well as taxable ones, they're quite limited. We think that uh, it's more likely as a general rule where the commissioner wants to simplify GST accounting, it's going to use existing mechanisms of safe harbours and uh, practical compliance guides. Now, a second measure that uh, was announced is relation to the excise payment deferral. Now, um, excise is, 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 is the classic sin tax in uh, Australian uh, tax system. It's, it's based on, uh, it's imposed on alcohol tobacco and uh, petroleum producers and uh, or, or importers of those products. Excise rates are high. They are sometimes very high. They often end up being between 20 and 75% of the retail price of the product. The, uh, at the moment, the current position is that Producers with an aggregate turnover of less than 10 million, they lodge their excise return monthly and they pay excise by the 21st day of the next month. But producers with an aggregate turnover of 10 million or more, 
they actually lodge their excise return weekly and they have to pay that excise by the next day, by 4 p.m. the next day. So for, for those people above, those, those producers above 10 million in turnover, they have a very high outlay of excise payments and typically that will be well before they're paid for sales made. And, and these, the players in this industry have been crying out for years for relief from that high uh, cash flow outlay burden. The position from 1st of July 2021 is that producers with aggregate turnover of between 10 million and 50 million, they will from then on be able to lodge their excise return monthly and pay excise by the 21st day of the next month. So the benefits are quite clear. It'll be one return per month instead of uh, instead of four or five, um, the the excise payment that they make will be delayed by between three to seven weeks on average, and um, the you can actually putting on a tax planning hat. You can see uh, a lot of planning of deliveries that are coming out of the bonded warehouses of such uh, producers around. The 30th of June, 2021. You, you can you can see there will be incentives to uh, to delay removing goods out of bond and triggering the excise from the 30th of June until the early weeks, early days of July, because that simple delay of one or two days could uh, give you a cash flow benefit of seven weeks in paying the excise. The likely benefits of this, uh, the likely beneficiaries of this measure are the, obviously the producers of eligible excisable goods. Thinking of a turnover between 10 and 50 million, my suggestions would be uh, the larger craft breweries, uh, distillers, smaller regional breweries, uh, the producers of LPG, LNG, CNG and biodiesel products and uh, importers of the same. Okay, and there's a, a final measure, which is the uh, a customs duty free treatment of COVID-19 medical products. Now, uh, this is, is limited to importation, obviously, of uh, hygiene and medical products to treat, diagnose and prevent the spread of COVID-19, uh, they, they include face masks, gloves, disinfectant preparations, test kits and reagents. The, the temporary duty free rate for these products has been extended from 1st of August 2020 to 31 December 2020. Now, um, just a, a point to make, uh, customs duty is largely a tax to protect Australian industry. It's, its revenue raising uh, benefit is a secondary one. It's typically a tax to protect Australian industry. The, uh, which then begs the question, what happens if further COVID-19 outbreaks occur or if there's a delayed vaccine? What happens next year? I think the hope of the government is that by that stage, there will be an Australian manufacturing capacity to produce all these hygiene and medical products to the quantities that are needed. Uh, but if that is not the case, then I think we can probably expect that this measure will be extended in whole or in part into next year. Let me uh, just finally look at uh, the issue of the federal budget and state taxes. Now, um, in the last six months in, in the media, all the talk has been about the federal government debt and um, the, the forward estimates from the budget from Tuesday night, we're looking at 
federal government debt approaching a trillion dollars. It's, it's, it's been overlooked that uh, the state governments have uh, been incurring uh, massive borrowings this year to, to provide the COVID-related support that they, for the first time in, in more than two decades, are now heavily moving into debt. And they, um, uh, they have to deal with it as well. And they obviously don't have the same revenue raising capacity as the Commonwealth. In the next uh, four to six months, based on announcements already made, we can see that the states and territories will have to borrow significantly further sums to support the payroll tax deferrals that are existing in most states and territories, uh, the land tax refunds that have been, uh, have been offered where landlords are required to agree rent assistance under uh, the Commonwealth arrangements. And, and then we've got the question of potentially the cost of COVID support if there's any second or third wave of outbreaks and lockdowns. The biggest revenue item for state governments is their share of the Commonwealth GST. And, and one of the things that this budget uh, revealed was that GST revenues are down by more than 20 billion over the forward estimates. So uh, the, the, the states and territories have not only increased costs, but reduced revenues. Over the next four weeks, the various state and territory budgets will be released. What are states and territories going to do about their need to, to raise revenue? Uh, the, 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 there's always the possibility of new and increased taxes in their area, in their areas, but you, you have to say that Again, there'd be limited community support for any such moves. The, um, the states would, will need to look at their spending and look to areas where they can think that they can cut spending, given that there are so many areas at the moment where their spending must have increased dramatically. And, you know, just three examples that come immediately to mind, the health budget, education budget and the police budget, you, you, you can imagine how much more those three departments have had to spend on COVID related matters. So spending cuts seem a difficult proposition at the moment. Maybe some of the states will be looking at privatising the few remaining assets they've got. But apart from just sort of laying low and copying it and borrowing more money, over the next few years, the most likely avenue that the states are gonna to have to go down is enhancing their audit programs in the, the big revenue earners for them, transfer duties, payroll taxes and land taxes. It seems to me that uh, that's where the state governments are going to have to draw the money they need from in the short term. And that's it for me. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks for that comprehensive review. Let's, um, let's get straight into our questions. We've got a whole range of uh, questions which we'll try and get through in the next half hour. Leading our panel today will be Jamie Towers. As I said before, Jamie is the head of um, the tax group in Brisbane and well known to many of our national and international clients. Although we've got a lot of questions. I might start with the first one with you, Jamie. Um, I'll go, we've got a range of questions, but I'll just start with one which has an international flavour to it. It's that my, my Australian company has a 100% subsidiary company in Singapore and the business is based there. So what do the proposed tax residency changes mean for that person? Yeah, look, that, that's a really good question, uh, Michael. Um, so the, the changes that were announced on budget night try to clarify the definition of a, um, of a corporate tax resident of Australia. 
Now, there was a, a case a couple of years ago that muddied the waters and uh, gave us a, a strange result in that you could have um, Australian shareholders with an overseas um, company not doing any business here, but it was still regarded as an Australian resident. So what the new changes do is if you've got your central management and control here, in order for it now to be an Australian resident, um, they must have some real commercial activities uh, uh, being carried on here. Um, so it's that commercial activity must be carried on in Australia in order for it to be regarded as a tax resident in Australia. So if you're not doing anything here, you've just got your, 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 your directors here, um, it shouldn't be regarded as an Australian tax resident. So great question. Okay, good, thank you. And um, Evan, I might direct this one to you. It's about the lifting of the, um, no, sorry, it's about the exemption from FTT on car parking for small and medium businesses. The question is simply, is this gonna be a temporary measure or is it a permanent measure? Yes, Michael, this is a permanent measure. So Excellent. this is increasing those thresholds for, for that exemption um, on a permanent basis. So I think that's very welcome. Okay, I, I've got another question. Uh, maybe uh, I'll direct that back to you, Jamie. Um, it's just confirming that in relation to the accelerated or the instant asset write-off. So if a business is in a trust, can they get the upfront deductions? Uh, yes, absolutely. So provided there, so that the new rules that have just come in apply to any business with a, um, an aggregated turnover of less than $5 billion. So you would expect that most trusts would have a, a turnover of, of less than that. So if they're acquiring an asset, um, so depreciable plants and equipment, um, any time after budget night up until 30th of June, 2022, regardless of what type of business structure, so sole trader, partnership, trust, or, or company, um, they can get that upfront uh, deduction. Okay, did anyone else want to comment on that or we move on? That's good. Okay, so in a similar vein, um, we've got the, the tax losses to carry forward to previous profits. I mean, the question here is, will, will that apply to, um, there's two bits, will they apply to trusts? Well, and the answer is that they won't apply to trusts, but will, will it apply to companies that no longer have tax credits. So will it apply? And that'll be the case where they've paid, a, they've paid tax and then paid out a frank dividend. Maybe I'll swing back to you, Evan, to answer that one. Yeah. So yeah, good question, Michael. Look, the simple example would be, let's say you've got a company that had its first year of profit, say in the 2019 year, and then maybe early in 2020, it paid out a frank dividend of all of those profits using the tax paid on the 2019 income as a franken credit, it will not be able to get a loss carry back for the 19 year because it has used all of those franken credits um, to pay a dividend. And so basically receiving the tax refund would put its franken account into negative and th that's not permitted. Unless, of course, it's paid tax subsequently, there would be some circumstances. But in the simple scenario um, there, then, then no, it would not be able to get a carry back because it's already used that tax um, to pass on franking credits to its shareholders. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. Just, um, I've, got a, I've got a super fun question here for you, Clive. It's... Um, it's in relation to the underperformance test. And it simply says, is this underperformance test for super funds, does it also apply for self-managed super funds? Yeah, thanks to somebody for finding a super question. Um, the underperformance test is uh, firstly going to be applied to my super products from the 1st of July, 2021. So that's your low cost, low option uh, super funds. That's then going to be extended to all uh, public super funds from uh, July 2022, but the intention is not for self-managed super funds. Um, again, if you're the trustee of a self-managed super fund, you're also the member, so you will already know that you're underperforming and you're only harming yourself. Restricting membership on new members to your own self-managed super fund probably isn't much of a deterrent. So um, I don't see that that will apply to self-managed super funds um, and the intention's not for that. 
But of course, we don't know 100% yet. Good, thank you. Um, a couple of quick other super funds we might deal with quickly, Clive. So I presume members are still able to switch super funds from time to time? Yeah, of course. You've still got the, the, that, that flexibility to chop and change. And I think that's where um, the, the greater transparency and the greater um, opportunity to see how your funds are performing compared to other funds via some of these online tools and also letters in the mail saying that your current fund is underperforming will, will prompt more of that and give people more of that opportunity to um, take control of their superannuation. Okay. Um, I just moved to another one now. Um, it's in relation to the job maker rules. And the question is, the employer must demonstrate the new employee will increase overall headcount and payroll. And the question is, well, what is the comparison period for this increase? How do you measure that? Who would yeah, like to take that? I'll, okay, I'll take Jamie. that one, Michael. Um, okay. So look, there's a really good uh, fact sheet on the, the budget website on this. And um, it says that, so there's two things. One, you need to increase the overall number of employees. And two, you need to increase the, um, the total amount of your payroll. And the comparison period, so for the number of employees, you're comparing it with um, those em people employed at the 30th of September 2020. And for the payroll, it's comparing it with the three month period ending 30th of September. So from the 1st of July 2020 to the 30th of September 2020. So comparing against that amount. Excellent, thank you. Keep those questions coming in while we've got our team there ready for you. I want to go to a couple that um, look at the asset write-off and the question, maybe I'll pass it to you Evan, the question is um, does IT development, so software system custom built, does that qualify as an asset for these instant asset write-offs? Mm. So it may, the question, so uh, software can be a depreciable asset, whether it's developed in-house or purchased from a third party, um, if it's used in the business. So if you're buying software for your employees to use in doing their jobs, that can be a depreciable asset. But if you're developing software as your product that you're then going to sell to your customers, mm -hmm. that it won't be a depreciable asset and it won't qualify. Okay, so I'll, I'll give, I'll answer, I've got another question on that topic I'll pass on to you. So will clients purchasing new software systems from someone that, um, you know, that's making them, this client here, and big hello to Peter Fennick, will that, will that include, you know, will, will they get the upfront deduction for them, like so, so for their, their, their customers? Well, if they're purchasing software for their, for their system. If they're searching, purchasing software that is going to be used in their business, yes. If they're purchasing software that they're on selling as a product to their customer, then no. Okay. So a second leg of that question is, will that deduction include not only the license but the implementation services as well? Um, so depending on the character of those, so if those would currently be considered... Um, part of the capital cost of that software and therefore um, under the depreciation rules included in the depreciable cost, then yes, that, that would also be available for a deduction. Okay, good. Um, let me just have a look here. It's another question here, perhaps for you, Jamie, we'll see. It says, um, can, this is about the new employee credit can this be backdated? Because here, this participant, he's hired a new employee in the last two weeks. And uh, if it can't be backdated, do they get it going forward from this point in time? Um, so as I mentioned before, you've really got to compare the employee numbers and the payroll um, as at that 30th of um, September. So if they were already an employee on the 30th of September, you need to increase your number of employees after that. So if they were already there, I would say, no, they won't get it for that particular employee. Okay. Bad luck. Um, I've just, there's one here. Oh yes, there's a couple about the luxury car 
tax limit. Maybe I'll stick with you, Jamie, on this one. But basically, the question is, um, are there still limits? Like if you're buying a car and you want to write it off under the instant asset write-off, is your write-off still limited to the luxury car tax limit? Yes. Um, unfortunately, yes, it is. Um, so if you're buying a $100,000 Land Cruiser, you're only going to uh, be able to claim depreciation the, on an instant asset write-off basis up to the, the 58000 odd um, luxury car tax limit, unfortunately. Yes, yeah, so like, although there are some extraordinary incentives, it doesn't go to getting that Lamborghini. No. Okay. Um, let me just have a look. Here's one, Evan, I'll ask you, it's in relation to the low and middle income tax offset. And in your presentation, you mentioned the low and middle income tax offset has been retained for the 21 year only, right? And the question is, does it mean I get a tax cut this year, but I'll pay more tax next year? Yeah, it essentially does mean that, Michael. Um, so that's up to an extra $1,080 that will only come through when you lodge your tax return as the way these offsets have worked. But yes, it does mean that goes away next year. And so when you compare the 2021 year to the 2022 year, many people will be paying more tax next year. Okay, thank you. Now, Stephen, I've got a question for you here. Um, you mentioned that state and territory governments may need to fund their increasing debts by tax recovered during audit activity. So the question you know, which follows from that is, well, you know, what do you think would be likely with their audit targets for these state governments? Okay, uh, the, in, in New South Wales, and I suspect will be in the other states as well. Uh, but in New South Wales, they've already commenced a program of uh, identifying foreign persons who own residential property and who, who are not paying the land tax surcharge. And that's called absentee owner surcharge and absentee surcharge in the other states and territories, I think. But, um, uh, so I suspect that's an easy target for the state and territory governments and, and often because they can do their research in the background by going to uh, mm -hmm. by going to immigration immigration department and working out you know is this person a citizen uh, where how long have they been in the country and uh, and it sort of somewhat insidiously I suspect there will be a lot more people who will be subject to that tax in the next 12 months simply because they haven't been able to get back here. Um, if they've got to be here for 200 days in a calendar year, for example, uh, and they can't get back here, they may well be subject to that tax. So I'd, I'd be saying the, the easiest target is the um, various land tax surcharges and absentee owner surcharges. But there's another one that's been a bit of a sleeper and it's a, a payroll tax matter and uh, there was a case earlier, or last year it was, where the Victorian Supreme Court of Appeal decided uh, for um, optical superstore. So it's um, an optometrist chain. And uh, they, to try and put it simply, uh, you know, the medicos provide the services to the patients, but an admin company behind the scenes collects the money direct from Medicare or the health funds and passes that on net of administration costs to the Medicos. Uh, the, the Victorian Supreme Court of Appeal concluded that that's, those payments to the Medicos from the admin company are subject to payroll tax and the High Court refused to hear the special leave application on that decision. Now, there, there are a lot of medicos who have structures like that a lot of other professional practices who have structures like that and a lot of franchise arrangements are structured like that every case has to be looked at differently but i suspect at some point the states and territories are going to decide on a program to look into who else they can capture under the uh the the uh outcome from that case in Victoria. 
Okay, thank you, Stephen. I think that question could also apply, we're not gonna answer it today, but eventually there's gonna be need some taxing to raise revenue, I think, in the longer term. Mm. And there's some thoughts about that, but that, that's for another, another time, I think. Let's go back to the, the, the more fundam the fundamental questions. Here I've got another one, perhaps for, for you, Evan. Instant asset write-off. Does this apply to second-hand assets? You know, so if, you, if a business buys mm. second-hand equipment, printer, office furniture, or car upgrade, but second-hand. Mm. So for businesses with turnover up to $50 million, up to $50 million, they can, they get the write-off for both new and second-hand assets. For businesses with turnover above that level, this this new write-off does not, is only for new assets. Now, the 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 small exception to that is until 30 June 2021, for businesses under 500 million of turnover, they can access the existing, ex, well, ex, and extended $150,000 threshold for secondhand assets. Yeah, so, and that's still a mm. that's still a significant um, significant tax incentive if it fits what you're wanting to try mm. and do. Okay, now Jamie, here got one for you. It's about a new employee. So, do the new employee payments also apply for not-for-profit organisations? Um, I, I believe so. Yes, I believe it's any type of employer. Um, can um, can attract this uh, this funding for new employees. So yes, yeah, that would make sense. Yes, yeah. The, the the government, the main push for the government is creating jobs. So they don't care what type of employer you are. So as long as you are increasing your your headcount and your payroll, then you should be eligible. Okay, then. Thank you. I've got another super question here, Clive. It basically, it's back to that super performance, which has raised quite a bit of interest here. Is a two-year performance suitable or would a five-year performance yardstick for super funds be better? I mean, it's a hard question to ask. I mean, and it goes on, any performance should be studied through one business cycle and not just two years. Yeah, and it's a very good point. And I think that's why it comes back to what the definition of underperformance is actually going to be. Um, it's extremely hard to uh, apply one rule to um, many funds, which is why I think they're targeting the simple ones first with the, the, the not many options, so they can be comparable. But when you go into um, the wide variety of funds, then it's very hard to, I guess, point the finger at one that's invested in infrastructure compared to one invested in international um, equity. So, uh, I think there's got to be a bit of work behind that, and and you're exactly right. I think um, two years is a very short time frame, um, which is why, you know, at the moment, for example, in a, a, a downturn due to things outside of people's control, um, how would you sort of yeah, poke people for having a poor performance over a two year period? Um, but again, it's probably going to be a moving moving target. Okay, thank you. Um, coming back perhaps to you, Evan, I've got questions back on the claiming a deduction for new assets. The one is, um, do I have to claim a deduction for new assets if I would prefer to have the depreciation deduction spread mm. over a number of years? Which sort of draws out the important point that this instant asset write-off is a timing difference. That timing difference can be critical. It doesn't, it doesn't dilute the benefit, but it is a timing difference. So that's the question. Is it a choice? Yes, it's, it's not a choice. And that may not be a benefit for everyone. So if you're a sole trader, for example, and you buy a new vehicle, that might be a significant portion of your taxable income this year. And the marginal tax rates that um, tax rates that you're getting that deduction against may end up being quite low. Whereas if you depreciate it, you might be getting the depreciation deductions at your highest rate over a number of years. So that upfront deduction is not always best for everyone. Okay, interesting. And again, it underlines that you have to understand, and for me, this is having a discussion with your advisor, what, what does it mean for your particular circumstances? Continuing that instant asset write-off, I'll stick with you, Evan, for a moment. It's that my company made profits in 2019 and paid 
$30,000 in tax. Can I use the new instant asset write-off rules to create a tax loss in 2021 and therefore claim back that tax paid in the 19 year or in mm. relation to the 19 year? Yes, absolutely you can. If your business is in a company and can qualify for that loss carry back, then if, if the tax loss arises from that upfront deduction on a new asset, that absolutely can qualify for loss carry back. Okay, thank you. Let me just, uh, something we've covered before, but I mentioned it again, just to get the message across. It says under the company, maybe for you, Jamie, under the company loss carryback rules, what happens if I've paid a frank dividend using the tax I paid in the prior year as franking credits? Yeah, so the, the, the key rule with the, the, the loss um, carryback is you must have a franking account balance. So if you've paid out all of your tax as a fully frank dividend or even a partially frank dividend, if you've got no franking credits left, then you cannot use the loss carryback um, measures, unfortunately. Okay, fair enough. How are we going for time? Yeah, a few more. Keep on sending in some questions if you'd like. Um, Clive, just for you as a question in relation to self-managed super funds, have the limits on contributions or the limits on pensions been increased for individuals? No, there hasn't been any changes to any of that. And, and again, that's probably one of the, I guess the, the only disappointments out of this is that um, there has been no allowance really for people who balances have dropped. If you've got a pension in place and you've already used up your transfer balance cap, um, you can't top that up. And conversely, if you've, your balance has dropped again and you want to put more money in, uh, you still are restricted to the current thresholds of $25,000 for concessional contributions and $100,000 in a, a financial year for non-concessional contributions, um, depending on your fund balance. So there hasn't been any changes there. Okay, thank you. And I've got another question here. It may be um, for you, Stephen. It's, it's a specific, but it's got general application in another way. It's about, recently the government announced a measure to pay 50% of event costs as a, as a boost to tourism. But, um, it, and we may have to get back to this client in, in relation to this question, but the question is, how does it, what is it, how does it go about accessing this grant? So um, I guess it depends what state he's in and, and how to go about are you, are you able to give him any direction, Stephen? Yeah, no, I'm not aware of that, sir. Okay, yeah, we'll come. Michael, I, I, yes, I've Jamie. looked at this recently. I think oh, that, was announced, um, that was announced a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so okay. the, the government is proposing to help to um, pay 50% uh, of your attendance at a trade fair, for example, in, in Australia. Um, so there will be an application process, but as it was only announced a couple of weeks ago, um, those application rules aren't available yet. Um, now, if you do search on the government website, um, it does talk about um, uh, applications will be open for events in 2021. So I would say over the next couple of months, the, the government will develop a formal application process for this 50% uh, 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 funding to attend the events. So I guess they will... We will circulate in our newsletter, perhaps if there's any more information on that. And um, yeah, keep, yes. keep, yeah, keep the we, we do have a, a business um, grant specialist. So uh, she's uh, across things as they um, come to fruition. So once that application process is open, we will uh, provide details on the newsletter. Okay, good. Thank you very much. And perhaps just a last one for Stephen, just if you, in a, in, a, in a quick answer, what do you think the next major changes in GST will be? Okay, look, if, if, we, if we use the word major and recognise that there isn't going to be a comprehensive change to uh, rates or, or base in the near future, my suggestion would probably be that uh, in the property area, the, the, the Commonwealth will think, well, what can we do 
to encourage construction and to uh, encourage affordable housing. And it may be that they offer GST concessions to the build to rent type of development. And uh, also that they may uh, remove one of the uh, competitive anomalies being faced by uh, for-profit retirement villages versus not-for-profit ones. So I, I suspect those two measures could lead to uh, a, a, a releasing of the entrepreneurial spirits in, in both of those sectors that will lead to a, a lot of construction and, uh, and more affordable accommodation. Okay, good. Thank you, Stephen. Well, I'm going to wrap up that Q&A panel now. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Um, it, it's, it's been good, and we will, if we haven't got to your question, we'll, we'll send an answer out to you. So, in summary, like this budget, it provides tremendous opportunities to get tax deductions for business spending. But that is in such an uncertain environment that they're doing whatever they can to try and give the business community confidence in the right specific sector to go out and spend. So what I really think is important is that you have a conversation with your Mazar advisor, so have it soon, so you understand the incentives and how they will work for you in your particular circumstances. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Our recording of this presentation will be sent to you, you know, following the webinar in the next few days. And you'll be able to watch it on demand by checking on the same link that you actually brought you here today. So thank you everybody and have a great day. Bye.